e to the pi i is equal to negative 1. Many people regard this formula as one of the most beautiful formulas in all of mathematics. I think it's beautiful because it ties a lot of different areas of elementary mathematics together. Trigonometry, elements of the types of limits that you learn in calculus, and the beginnings of complex numbers and complex analysis. But the question is, what does it mean to raise a number like e to an imaginary power? i is equal to the square root of negative 1. That means that i is a number, so that when we square it, i squared is equal to negative 1. If you think about that for a little while, you'll see why it's unusual. When you square real numbers, you always get a positive answer. If I square a negative number, like negative 2 squared, I get positive 4. And if I square a positive number, like 4, I get positive 16. So in order to square something and get a negative number, it has to be very unusual indeed. And in fact, that's what we call i. It's the number that's designed to be squared to make it negative. So the question still remains, what does it mean to take a number like e to the pi i power? The pi part is too bad because pi is a real number. It's 3.415 approximately. But i isn't real. So what does it do? Well, what you'll see from the proof that I'm going to offer today is that this ends up being exactly negative 1. So let's embark on the journey. E is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 plus 1 over n to the n power. This is the definition of E. That means that E to the x is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 plus 1 over n to the nx power. Now for the purposes of our proof, it will be more convenient if we write this limit in a slightly different form. So let's let y be equal to n times x. That way I can replace nx with y. And if y is equal to nx, then we also know that x over y will be equal to 1 over n. I just manipulated that equation into the second one. So now making the appropriate replacements, we have e to the x is equal to the limit and so I can replace the limit as n goes to infinity with the limit as y goes to infinity of 1 plus, replace 1 over n with x over y, and replace nx with y. So this is a definition of e that will be better for us to work with. The next formula that I would like to use is called the binomial theorem. It says that a plus b, that two-part element is a binomial, to the n power is equal to the sum from k is equal to 0 up to n of n choose k times a to the n minus k power times b to the k. This formula allows us to expand binomials like this one. So now I apply the binomial theorem to e to the x. e to the x will be equal to the limit as y goes to infinity of the sum from k is equal to 0 up to y. I'm going to replace y with n of y 
choose k all times, now a is equal to 1, to the y minus k power, and b is equal to x over y to the k. So now we have a new definition of e to the x. So e to the x is equal to the limit as y goes to infinity. And my ultimate goal at this point is to actually evaluate this limit of I need a big bracket, um, y choose 0, k is 0, times x to the 0, y to the 0, etc. And somewhere off in the distance, there's the closed big bracket for the limit. I have e to the x equal to the limit as y goes to infinity of, now I'm going to multiply this expression out. y choose 0 will be equal to 1, because when you choose 0, it's always 1. And this expression is 0 power, so the, that's 1 as well. So we have 1 times 1 giving us 1. Plus, now y choose 1. That's going to be y factorial all over y minus 1 factorial times 1 factorial. And that, along with this y here, means that all we're left with is x. So it's 1 plus x. Now the next term, well, let's write it out down here. The next term will be y, what's this one? y factorial all over y minus 2 factorial times 2 factorial times y squared and x squared. So what we'll see will happen is that um, we can cancel out um, everything up to y and y minus 1. So we're left with y times y minus 1 in the numerator for that part times x squared all over y squared. And a similar thing happens for the next term, giving us y times y minus 1 times y minus 2 um, times x to the third all over 3 factorial um, y to the third. Oh, and there needs to be a 2 factorial. I left out. All right, let's take it to the next step. I'll start over here for extra space. e to the x is equal to the limit as y goes to infinity of the quantity of 1 plus x. Now what I want to do is I have y squared in the denominator, and I see y appears 1, 2 times in the numerator. Um, so I'm going to divide the numerator by y, and I'm going to divide the product in the numerator term-wise. We have y divided by y is 1. Shh, shh, be quiet. We have y minus 1 divided by y will be 1 plus 1 over y times x squared all over 2 factorial. Then we have 1 plus 1 minus 1 over y times 1 minus 2 over y times x to the third all over 3 factorial and this continues on and on and on. So now that I have every expression or every term written in this way, I can say what happens as y goes to infinity. As y goes to infinity, 1 over y goes to 0. So the simplified expression now without the limit is that e to the x is equal to 1 over 5 factorial plus, and it continues into infinity. This is the power series expression for e to the x. And once you have e to the x in the form of a power series, you start to be able to see the relationship between it and two of the other beautiful functions in elementary mathematics, the sine function and the cosine function.